Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Thanks for being here today. We are happy to have Dr. Sharif Moore with us and Dr. Rhonda Brown with Healthy Blue. Dr. Sharif Moore is with the Drug Free America Foundation. We're proud to partner with Healthy Blue to get this information out to you, as you know that this is a very important topic here in the state of Missouri and all around the nation. So we're very excited to be uh, presenting this here today. Just wanted to real quick touch base. Um, my name is Alicia Osenberger. I'm with ACT Missouri, and we are a statewide prevention agency. And we have Katrina Weberg. Chuck Doherty and Dave Clausen, who is also part of ACT Missouri. So we welcome you. And with that, Dr. Sharif Moore is an epidemiologist with the Drug Free America Foundation, and he works on a lot of policy and programming issues with the information that he does gather. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Moore. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for having me. It's truly a pleasure to be here with you all. So in addition to being an epidemiologist with the Drug Free America Foundation, I also happen to be in recovery myself and recently celebrated my sixth year of freedom from opioid addiction. So today I'll be covering the topic of opioids and we'll start with a general overview of what opioids are and how they work in the body. Then I'll go over the historical basis of opioid use before getting into the rise of America's current opioid epidemic, which happens to be the second in our nation's history. So I'll also be presenting data on trends at the national and local level for the state of Missouri. So let's begin with an expl explanation of what opioids are. Now the terms opioid and opiate are often used interchangeably but there actually is a distinction. An opioid is any natural semi-synthetic or synthetic chemical that interacts with opioid receptors on nerve cells located throughout the body and brain. The term opiate refers specifically to natural opioids that are derived directly from the resin of the opium poppy, papaver somniferum. And this includes codeine, morphine, heroin, and thebane. So the broader term opioids includes all the synthetic compounds such as fentanyl, methadone, and tramadol, uh, the semi-synthetics such as oxycodone and hydrocodone, which are synthesized from thebane, one of the uh, alkaloids found in the opium poppy, and it also includes the natural opiates. And this category also includes uh, mitrigenine, which is the intoxicating compound that's found in kratom, and it also includes tianeptine, which is a legal high that's gaining in popularity. It was first designed as an antidepressant uh, used mostly in Europe, but people found out that uh, if they took massive doses, it would produce an opioid-like high. So all opiates are opioids, but not all uh, opioids are opiates. But all members of the opioid drug class share common features such as having agonist activity at the mu opioid receptor, and they're highly addictive with rapid progression to physiological dependence, tolerance, and withdrawal. So opioid drugs, they mimic the effect of our natural pain relieving chemicals called endorphins. They do this by attaching to opioid receptors located on nerve cells throughout the body, um, on the brain, spinal cord, and gut. Uh, and when opioids bind to these receptors, they block pain messages that are sent from the body through the spinal cord to the brain. Now, when opioid opioids bind with uh, receptors in the brain stem, they slow down the neurons that control respiration. So respiratory depression is the dangerous side effect and is the chief cause of death in cases of opioid overdose. So in addition to relieving pain, opioids lead to um, intense feelings of euphoria due to the, uh, the brain reward, the intense brain reward that they stimulate through uh, release of dopamine. So opioids are enormously reinforcing and they actually change the chemistry of the brain leader, leading to tolerance, dependence, and addiction 
or opioid use disorder. Opioid use disorder is defined as an overpowering desire to use opioids despite social and professional consequences. And these are the 11 criteria that are used in diagnosing a patient with opioid use disorder. They include continued use of opioids despite worsening physical or psychological health, continued use leading to social and interpersonal consequences, decreased social or recreational activities, difficulty fulfilling professional and academic duties, spending excessive time obtaining opioids or needing excessive time to recover from taking them, Take, taking more than intended, um, having intense cravings, being unable to decrease the amount that are used, uh, increasing tolerance, using despite, uh, despite it being physically dangerous, and uh, withdrawal syndrome. So if a patient meets just two of these criteria, they meet the case de de definition for opioid use disorder. Um, however, I think most, if not all people who have suffered from opioid addiction will tell you that they easily meet all 11 of these criteria. Thankfully, there are very effective medications for opioid use disorder. We have methadone, buprenorphine, and naltrexone. Uh, methadone is a synthetic long-acting opioid with pharmacologic actions that are similar to morphine. So methadone is a full agonist of the mu receptor. And as you can see in the, um, the diagram here, the graphic, um, since it's a full agonist, it completely occupies the mu receptor. One of the disadvantages to methadone is that it can only be dispensed through special clinics which require the patient to go in person every day. Um, and this is very inconvenient for those with work and family obligations. But methadone has been around for a long time. It was initially developed by the Germans shortly before World War II to be used as a pain reliever uh, in case of a morphine shortage. Buprenorphine is a newer synthetic opioid that is a partial agonist. So it doesn't fully occupy the, the receptor. Um, the advantages of buprenorphine is that it doesn't cause as much respiratory depression as methadone, and it can be prescribed in an office setting by a primary care doctor. Buprenorphine does, however, have a very high affinity for the mu opioid receptor. So if patients initiate buprenorphine, buprenorphine treatment too soon after their last opioid use, they will go into precipitated withdrawal. And uh, precipitated withdrawal is like opioid withdrawal on steroids. And this occurs because buprenorphine, because it has such a high affinity for the receptor, it will tear any other opioid off of that mu receptor. And since it only partially occupies the receptor, the person is thrown into uh, a precipitated withdrawal. Most patients are advised to wait at least 24 hours since their last use before they initiate buprenorphine therapy. Um, however, illicit fentanyl use poses a unique challenge uh, with buprenorphine because fentanyl is a lipophilic or fat soluble molecule. So it remains in the body for a very long time. So these patients, uh, they have to endure the agony of fentanyl withdrawal and wait several days before they start buprenorphine if they want to avoid precipitated withdrawal. So for many of these patients, methadone is more appropriate since it doesn't cause precipitated withdrawal because it, it's a full agonist. So given the prevalence of fentanyl use, um, a loosening of the antiquated methadone system, uh, which in a way almost seems uh, punitive as well in nature, that would definitely be a step in the right direction. And the uh, final medication is naltrexone, which is an opioid antagonist. And it pro provides a complete blockade of the mu opioid receptor. Uh, naltrexone is typically given as per month, the viv Vivitrol shot. So the blockade uh, that naltrexone provides uh, of the mu receptors lasts for 30 days. 
But the disadvantage to that is uh, to naltrexone is that patients need to be opioid free for at least seven days because uh, like buprenorphine, naltrexone will also displace opioids and cause precipitated withdrawal. So patients pretty much have to undergo full withdrawal, which many can't tolerate um, before they, they, they take naltrexone. So opioid use disorder affects 16 million people worldwide, of which 3 million are in the US. So we have the highest proportion of people by far addicted to opioids. Uh, approximately 120,000 people die from opioid use, from opioid overdose worldwide, and at least 50,000 die per year in the U.S. just from opioids. Since 1999, over 500,000 people, half a million people, have died in the U.S. from opioid overdose. Most uh, deaths in the U.S. occur in the 25 to 64 age group. Um, Opioid addiction and overdose uh, rates vary by age and gender. Men are much more likely to use, become addicted and overdose and die from opioid use. Uh, however, women are actually prescribed opioids more often than men for pain relief. So there's a, a combination of genetic, health, social, economic, and lifestyle factors that determine uh, an individual's risk. And these include uh, having a history of substance abuse or mental illness, uh, the, and impulsivity and sensation-seeking personality type, living in poverty and in a rural area, associating with others who abuse opioids and other drugs, having easy access to opioids, and having adverse childhood experiences. Now, I want to dial in a bit on the adverse childhood experiences because they are so important in the etiology of opioid use disorder. After genetic factors, adverse childhood experiences or ACEs are probably the largest con contributor to individual risk uh, for addiction and for opioid addiction specifically. The list of adverse childhood experiences uh, it includes physical, psychological, emotional, or sexual abuse, um, physical and emotional ne neglect. Divorce is considered to be an adverse childhood experience. Uh, growing up in a dysfunctional home where there is spousal abuse uh, or a family member that has a mental health or substance use disorder or um, having a parent that's incarcerated. Those are all examples of uh, ACEs. So we know from studies that highly prevalent uh, in our society with 64% of Americans having one and 40% having two or more. Now having four or more uh, ACEs makes a person five times more likely to develop a substance use disorder. And if they are male, they're 46 times more likely to become an, inju an, an injection drug user. And multiple studies have linked ACEs with opioid use specifically, we found that the more ACEs a person has, the younger they initiate opioid use and the greater the risk of of injection drug use at the population level can be attributed to ACEs. This is a scan of a healthy brain and the, the abused or trauma exposed brain typified by someone with several ACEs. When there's stress and trauma, uh, endorphin systems uh, don't develop properly. Uh, the entire brain structure is, is changed. So people uh, that are exposed to trauma, they're actually much more likely to find relief from drugs than people with um, you know, healthy brains. You may have heard people remark that, you know, and my, my mother is a good example of this. They say, I don't see how anyone can enjoy this, the feeling produced by opiates or opioids. Hey, uh, they just make me feel dizzy. Hey, hey Sharif. Yes. Uh, your audio is coming through a little gargled. 
Um, almost like there's wind blowing on the mic or the microphone is moving around, rubbing up against to something. Maybe I should put headphones. It was doing good at the beginning, but now it's starting to come across a little choppy and it's a little hard to hear you. Reminds you of if somebody were outside on a windy day. Is this any better? Talk again. Is this better? Um, we're still getting it from your microphone. Is this any better or still hard? We're still getting a lot of the, the background noise. Yep, we do have everybody else muted except for Sharif and I. That seems to be a, a problem coming across from your microphone, Sharif. Are you using your built-in computer microphone or an external microphone? I just uh, I just put in the headset before it was on okay. the external microphone. Okay, so then down by the mute, unmute button, there's a little carrot. When you uh -huh. click that carrot, it will give you the options to switch your microphone. Yes. But that way it'll use your headset microphone instead of your external or computer microphone. How's that? Coming through a little bit better. There's a little background noise, but not bad. Um, How's that for everybody else? Can I get some thumbs up if that's better? All right, perfect. Thumbs up from folks in the room. Would you mind going back one slide and picking up there? Right. Some folks were wanting to really catch that information. All right, right sorry, here. everybody. Yeah, I yes, apologize good. for that. Oh, much better now, much better. Thank you. Okay, Carry good. on. Okay, so multiple studies have linked ACEs with opioid use specifically. The more ACEs a person has, the younger they initiate opioid use and the greater their risk of injecting and dying from overdose. Uh, in women, 78% of injection drug use at the popula population level can be attributed to ACEs. So it's a very powerful risk factor. So this is a scan of a healthy brain and alongside the abused or trauma exposed brain typified by several ACEs. When there's stress and trauma, endorphin systems don't develop properly and people are much more likely to find relief from drugs than people with healthy brains, uh, healthy brain structure and function. Um, you might hear many people say that they don't understand how anyone can find opioids pleasurable. Uh, my mother is an example of this. They say that um, they just make me feel uh, dizzy, nauseous, and tired. Whereas another person that has modified brain structure due to trauma will feel an overwhelming sense of euphoria and well-being and wholeness that is incredibly hard to resist from the very first use. So I'm gonna go into the history of opioid use and humanity has had a long relationship with the opium poppy. The earliest reference to opium growth and use is from 3400 BC when it was cultivated in lower Mesopotamia which is uh, in modern day Iraq, Iran, Syria, and Turkey. We do know from Neolithic ruins in Europe that the cultivation of the poppy goes back as far as 6,000 years, uh, probably farther. Uh, the Sumerians do it as the joy plant and they passed it on to the Assyrians who in turn passed it on to the Egyptians uh, it made its way to ancient Greece and was used in medicine there. And Homer called it a wondrous substance, 
saying that those who consumed it did not shed a tear all day long, even if their mother or father had died before their own eyes. Uh, opium was also a part of medieval medicine, and the first recorded regulation of opioids was from medieval France, where the king issued an edict concerning the use of theriac, which was a medieval concoction containing opium. Uh, even back then, they recognized the addictive nature of it. So as people learned of the power of opium, demand for it increased, and it spread along the Silk Road through India, Central Asia, and finally to China, where it was the catalyst for the opium wars of the mid 1800s. And that is actually uh, relevant to our present situation in the United States, in the United States. So the, the catalyst for the opium wars was a trade imbalance that existed between uh, Britain and China due to the surging demand for Chinese tea in England. So to correct this imbalance, the British started exporting massive quantities of opium from their colony in India to sell in China. And the result was devastating for Chinese society. Over 10% of the population uh, became addicted to opium. Uh, and opium, the main constituents are morphine and codeine. So essentially, 10% uh, of the Chinese population were addicted to morphine. Uh, the Chinese attempted to put a stop to the trade, uh, but all of their attempts were put down uh, by brutal force. So basically, the British were selling opium and addicting the Chinese populace at the point of a gun. And this is relevant to us today because the US and other foreign powers helped to put down some of the resistance movements in China, like the Boxer Rebellion. And we also had a, a hand in China, enforcing China to make several humiliating uh, concessions and trade deals. And these events led to what the Chinese still refer to today as the century of humiliation. So several experts on China have said that the Chinese government's lax enforcement on illicit fentanyl production is partly motivated by a desire for revenge on the West for the opium wars and the century of humiliation. And as uh, US attorney Matt Cronin said, uh, China could halt illicit fentanyl production in a day if they really wanted to. So modern opioid pharmacology was born when morphine was isolated from opium by a German ke chemist Friedrich Sertner in 1805. And the isolation of morphine from the opium poppy was actually one of the greatest advances in Western medicine. Um, up to that time, you know, pain control basically consisted of, you know, biting down on a stick and maybe a swig of whiskey if you were lucky. 70 years after the isolation of morphine from opium, heroin was synthesized by an English chemist named Alder Wright. He was experimenting with acetylating uh, morphine, which is basically catalyzing a reaction between morphine and acetic anhydride, resulting in the substitution of the hydroxyl groups on the morphine molecule, which are the two OH groups uh, on the morphine molecule here. And uh, they're substituted by two acetyl groups. Um, hence, the chemical name for, morph for heroin is morphine diacetate or diacetylmorphine. The presence of the two acetyl groups allow the hero heroin molecule to pass through the blood brain barrier much more quickly than morphine. And this results in a two to three fold increase in potency over morphine, as well as an immediate rush of euphoria and well being. After passing the blood brain barrier, heroin undergoes first pass metabolism in the body where it's where the molecule is de deacetylated and then it's converted back to morphine. So heroin is essentially a, a morphine pro drug. Uh, in 1895, Bayer a pharmaceutical company independently 
resynthesized morphine diacetate and marketed, marketed it as a, an over-the-counter drug under the trademark name heroin. Now it was developed, um, it was intended to be a substitute for morphine uh, to be used as a cough suppressant. And they were, they were trying to develop something that did not have morphine's addictive side effects. Because um, at the time, morphine was a popular recreational drug and there, were a lot, there was a lot of addiction. So Bayer wanted to find a similar but non-addictive substitute uh, to bring to market. But contrary to their advertising, uh, as a non-addictive morphine substitute, heroin would soon have one of the highest rates of addiction in its users. Uh, Felix Hoffman, the chemist who synthesized heroin at, at Bayer, was actually uh, acetylating morphine with the objective of producing codeine, which is less potent and less addictive. Other uh, commonly used semi-synthetic opioids like hydrocodone and oxycodone were invented in Germany around 1920. Uh, and both were introduced to the US market after World War II. And perhaps the world's most infamous oxycodone addict was Adolf Hitler, who received daily injections of oxycodone from his personal physician, Theo Morel. And ironically and tragically, the, the chemist who invented oxycodone perished in the Holocaust. Today, illicit heroin is made in clandestine laboratories by extracting morphine uh, from dried opium latex. Now, why would traffickers go to the trouble of doing, of doing this? Why not just stop with morphine? Well, it's the same reason that fentanyl is replacing heroin. The potency per weight uh, of heroin is much higher than that of morphine. A kilogram of morphine will yield roughly 10,000 doses, whereas a kilo of heroin will yield 30,000 or more doses. And with fentanyl, that number skyrockets to millions of doses in, in a kilogram. Now, many people might be surprised that the history of opioid use in the US is as old as the nation itself. During the Revolutionary War, uh, both sides used opium to treat sick and wounded soldiers. The founding father Benjamin Franklin took opium later in life regularly to cope with severe pain from a bladder stone. And after his fatal duel with Aaron Burr, Alexander Hamilton was given laudanum, which was a tincture of opium mixed with alcohol. Thomas Jefferson, though he was generally skeptical of uh, medical treatments, turned to laudanum in his later years to help ease his chronic diarrhea. And he felt so much better on the drug that he wrote to a friend saying, with care and laudanum, I may consider myself in what is to be my habitual state. And I find, I find uh, Jefferson's use of the word habitual to be telling. Uh, he also grew a large number of copies of his own on his Monticello estate, which actually thrived until the 1990s when the DEA destroyed them. But it was really the Civil War that helped set off America's first opioid addiction. Um, the Union Army alone issued nearly 10 million opium pills to its soldiers, plus an additional 2.8 million ounces of opium powders and tinctures. Uh, so a large number of soldiers returned home addicted or with war wounds that were only with pain that was only relieved by opium or morphine. And during those times, morphine addiction was referred to as soldier's disease. So by 1888, opioids made up 15% of all prescriptions dispensed in Boston. Uh, opiates were sold in a completely unregulated medical marketplace. Physicians prescribed them for a wide range of indications and pharmacists sold them to individuals who were medicating themselves for various physical and mental discomforts. By 1895, morphine and opium powders led to an addiction epidemic that affected roughly one in 200 Americans. Uh, but that, that rate is far lower than today 
Um, today, it's, it's 20 to 30 times higher than it was then. So finally, uh, in 1906, the federal government started cracking down um, first by passing the Pure Food and Drug Act, which required um, accurate labeling uh, of any kind of pharmaceutical or food product. And this was followed by the Smoking Opium Expulsion Act in 1909, which shut down the opium dens uh, found throughout the US in, in larger cities. And finally, the Harrison Narcot Narcotics Tax Act was passed in 1914, which regulated ta and taxed the production, importation, and distribution of opiates and cocaine products. Now, this act also limited the ability of doctors to prescribe opiates, and they were prohibited from prescribing them for addiction because under the act, addiction was not considered to be a medical condition. So this gave rise to the notion that addiction was a moral failing, and it ushered in an era of opiophobia in which doctors were very reluctant to prescribe opioids. But all that began to change in the 1980s when physicians were incorrectly reassured that the risk of addiction was low when opioids were prescribed for, for chronic pain. Uh, in 1980, a one page, a one paragraph letter appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine, claiming that there were only four cases of documented addiction out of nearly 12,000 who are given at least one narcotic preparation. The article concluded that despite widespread use of narcotic drugs in hospitals, the development of addiction was rare in medical patients with no history of addiction. And so, I mean, this art article was not evidence-based at all and neglected to mention that those patients were prescribed opioids for a very short length of time, uh, whatever length of time they were in the hospital. But despite that, the article was cited hundreds of times in the literature and even more by representatives of drug manufacturers who used it to aggressively market drugs like OxyContin. In 2000, the Joint Commission, which is the national organization that accredits hospitals and health systems, they published a book that targeted doctors uh, as part of their required uh, continuing education. The book cited studies claiming that there was no evidence that addiction was a significant issue when persons were given opioids for pain control. And not surprisingly, um, the book was sponsored by Purdue Pharma. Uh, others have also blamed the increasing use of opioids for chronic pain on the emphasis on pain as the fifth vital sign, which started uh, in 1995, when the physician group, uh, the American Pain Society started to aggressively uh, push this concept. By the late 1990s, the Joint Commission and others emphasized that pain needed to be assessed regularly. And because pain uh, was a subjective measure, that providers needed to respect patient self reporting of pain. So the result was that Americans ended up consuming prescription opioids at a greater rate than any other population in the world. Uh, consuming almost 100% of the world's hydrocodone and 81% of the world's oxycodone. Um, and, uh, the CDC actually reported between 1999 and 2010 that there was a fourfold increase in opioid prescriptions. And in 2000, uh, 2012, providers wrote a staggering 259 million prescriptions for opioid analgesics, which is enough for every American adult to have their own bottle of pills. But I mean, it begs the question, is there, was there more chronic pain in America than in other countries? No, um, a study was done examining chronic pain and opioid use in developed and underdeveloped countries. And the United States was found to have similar age standardized prevalence of chronic pain as uh, France and Italy and other European countries. 
However, uh, our per capita daily opioid consumption was six to eight times greater in the United States than in those countries. So as the number of prescriptions rose, uh, so did the number of people seeking treatment for opioid use disorder and tragically the number of overdose deaths. Uh, in 2011, the federal and state governments though really started cracking down by passing uh, anti-pill mill legislation, uh, reducing opioid supply, uh, crafting stricter prescribing guidelines, and establishing uh, prescription drug monitoring programs that prevented doctor shopping. So in this graph, we can see the different trends in the epidemic over time. And you can see how deaths from prescription opioids represented by the light blue line started rising from 1999 uh, onwards before leveling off in 2010 when deaths from heroin started to increase and the second wave of the epidemic began. So uh, as use of prescription opioids became more prevalent in our society in the 1990s and early 2000s, the Mexican drug cartels took note. Um, early on in the first wave of the epidemic, they saw the business opportunity presented by the presence of a large number of people addicted to prescription opioids north of the border. And as you can see from this graph, up until the mid 2000s, uh, Colombia, which is represented by the orange bars, was the major source country for high purity heroin arriving in the US. Knowing that it was only a matter of time before the US government started cracking down on prescription opioids, uh, the Mexican cartels recruited Colombian heroin chemists who had themselves learned from Southeast Asian syndicates uh, to teach them how to produce high purity heroin to meet um, the, the growing demand that they projected uh, would exist in the future. Uh, and up, up till then, most of the heroin produced in Mexico was of a very low uh, grade, uh, it was black tar that's found mostly west of the Mississippi. So the focus on uh, the government crackdown and, and the focus on shutting down pill mills and preventing doctor shopping made prescription opioids like Oxycontin uh, more difficult to get and much more expensive. So this had the unintended consequence of pushing prescription drug addicts to heroin which was more potent and much cheaper. Uh, and so prescription opioid users were far more likely to initiate heroin use than heroin, uh, than non-users. And the vast majority of new heroin users reported previous prescription opioid use, uh, as you can see in this graph, where the, uh, the blue represents uh, new heroin users that started on prescription opioids. Uh, as the second wave gained momentum, heroin use increased dramatically uh, across all segments of the population, cutting across demographic and uh, socioeconomic lines, uh, increasing in uh, the working poor, middle class, and upper income brackets. So again, uh, in this graph, we can see the, the rise in overdose deaths from heroin represented by the dark blue line started rapid, rapidly increasing in 2010 before uh, finally starting to level off in 2015. Um, however, the, the third wave of the epidemic characterized by illicit fentanyl use, uh, which is represented by the purple line um, started in 2013, and deaths from fentanyl uh, really started to overtake deaths from uh, other opioids in 2016. This was most likely due to the proliferation uh, of counterfeit pills containing fentanyl. 
So fentanyl was first synthesized by Paul Janssen in 1960 and approved for medical use in the United States in 1968. It's the most widely used synthetic opioid in medicine. Uh, it's used for severe pain and also as an anesthetic. But the fentanyl responsible for the surge in deaths in the United States comes from, is illicitly produced in clandestine labs in China and Mexico. Uh, fentanyl is 100 times more potent than morphine, 50 times more potent than heroin. And um, some fentanyl analogs like carfentanyl can be uh, as much as 10,000 times more potent uh, than morphine. So the potency of fentanyl and carfentanyl present multiple dangers because users are often unaware of the, the potency of what they're taking. And that leads to accidental overdosing on either fentanyl-laced heroin and fake pills. An illicit fentanyl has already displaced, completely displaced heroin in many parts of the country. It's relatively easy and cheap to produce. And unlike heroin, it is not land, labor, and time intensive. Uh, to produce one kilo of heroin requires cultivation of one acre of poppies. So it's very labor intensive. Uh, whereas, you know, with a rudimentary knowledge of chemistry and the, the right pre precursor chemicals, uh, multiple kilos of fentanyl can be cranked out from a clandestine lab in a few hours. And the profit margin of fentanyl over heroin is like north of a thousand percent, which is what makes it so attractive to traffickers. Most of the fentanyl is sourced from China, where it's shipped to Mexico with uh, no restrictions whatsoever. China also supplies pre precursor chemicals that are necessary for synthesizing fentanyl which the cartels also do themselves before packaging and smuggling it into the US um, across our su Southwest border. And also a large amount because it's so potent by weight, um, it can be easily smuggled through the postal service. And so a lot of it is also purchased uh, on the dark net and shipped into the country by mail. And again, China could shut down production if they wanted to, if they truly wanted to. Seizures, uh, so seizures of um, fentanyl have been dramatically increasing. Uh, what is especially concerning, though, is the rise in cocaine and meth adulterated with fentanyl, which um, often kills unsuspecting users because they're not expecting their meth or cocaine to have fentanyl in it. Now, deaths from fentanyl really started dramatically increasing in 2015, and this is most likely due to the proliferation of counterfeit pills containing fentanyl. Uh, in 2019, uh, there were a total of 70,630 deaths from overdose, with most of those involving fentanyl. So the, these counterfeit pills, they're, they're produced in Mexico using professional pill presses, and they look exactly like um, oxycodone or Xanax pills. Uh, oftentimes, these pills have hot spots that contain a lethal dose of fentanyl, um, and often the, 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 the dose is inconsistent across pills. So one pill might have one micro, microgram and another might have 10 micrograms, which uh, would be a lethal dose. So here on this map, uh, we can see that most of the country experienced a surge uh, in fentanyl related deaths from 2014 to 2017. Uh, and that included uh, large increases on the West Coast, which had up to that uh, point had been largely uh, spared uh, until the fentanyl pills started going around. And that's because the dominant form of heroin west of the Mississippi uh, is black tar, which is much harder to adulterate with fentanyl than uh, powdered heroin. 
And uh, Missouri, uh, during this time period, uh, overdose deaths uh, increased by almost 486%, so a huge increase. So now let's take a look at some of the data from Missouri. Uh, most overdose deaths are clustered around the St. Louis metropolitan area. And as in the rest of the country, uh, overdose deaths have been skyrocketing with fentanyl starting to displace heroin uh, and causing more deaths from uh, 2013 onward. And again, uh, similar to the, the, the pattern found in the rest of the country, uh, heroin and fentanyl deaths are concentrated in the 25 to 44 age group. But here's where Missouri diverges from the rest of the country, and that's in the racial distribu distribution of overdose deaths. In most of the US, in both urban and rural areas, death rate Where are we headed in terms of the overall epidemic? Um, nationwide, uh, we're now moving in public health experts and officials are called 